In case you miss it, here's a sports animal rewind. Let's talk about Saturday's game. Auburn at Tennessee. We bring in college football analyst for ESPN, national director of recruiting as well, friend of the show. Tom Luganbill joins us here on the new Sentinel Sports page. Hey, Tom, Vince, and Evan Woodbury here in Knoxville. How you doing, Tom? I'm good. Good morning, fellas. Good morning. morning. And and you are someone that has come such a long way on Twitter, Tom. I remember talking to you about Twitter, and you're like, no way. Now, I bought it for like two years, <laughs> and then I got forced into it. But now you're a force on Twitter now. If you, if you have anything good to say about Twitter at all. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> all right. We'll move on then. Uh, <laughs> Well, Tom, before we get, I want to get your quick thoughts at the end before we wrap up on the three big games in college football. You know what they are. We'll get to those. And then on Tennessee Auburn this Saturday. But first, you were on the sidelines last week in calling the, the Tennessee Missouri game. What was your takeaway from Tennessee standpoint from that 31 to three loss? Well, I, I think that it, it was a great learning experience for a young freshman quarterback in Josh Dobbs to, to be the full time starter, have to prepare for a week as the full-time starter, which is an entirely different dynamic, and then having to go on the road. And as the game unfolded, I, you know, I, I saw some lost opportunities. You know, there was a deep vertical ball that I thought was really well thrown that you know, likely should have been caught for a touchdown that would have been early in the first quarter and given this offense some, some confidence. And, you know, they just a, – a play here, a play there, and, you know, all of a sudden you, you stay in it, you get some points, and – Again, confidence comes into play, and they were never able to get over that hump. They were never able to make that one play here and make that one play there, and then it got away from them. And when that happened, and you're on the road, and the crowd's all over you, and you do have youth uh, under center, it started to snowball on them a little bit. But the one thing I did notice, and I've noticed this on tape, and as you guys know, I've, I've had Tennessee now three of the last four weeks, is this team keeps playing hard. They keep fighting. There's a, there's a hop in their step. If you're a Tennessee fan, watch how the players run an, on and off the field, whether the score is 7-7 seven to seven or 31-7. to seven. Watch how they move. Watch their body language. It will tell you a lot about their belief system in the direction that this thing is heading. T- Tom, I know you're a, a big film guy, and I, I was wondering what you thought of just the structure of Tennessee's offense against Mizzou, it, it did seem like they were willing to open it up some for Josh Dobbs, maybe in a way that they hadn't in the past under Justin Worley with, with the multiple receiver sets and five wides and, and two backs and trying some new things. Or do you think that was just a sense of we know we're not going to be able to run the ball against Missouri, so we're going to have to try to throw early? Uh, or do you think maybe they, they do see Josh Dobbs as a way to open up the offense a bit? Well, I, I definitely believe they see Josh Dobbs as not only a way to open up the offense a little bit, but a player that's a better fit for what they want their offense to be, what they want the identity to be, and that is an athletic quarterback that can be a runner as part of your system but doesn't have to be the runner. And there's a very there's a very clear distinction between those two because any time the quarterback's athletic, any time the quarterback can buy time, he can create, he can improvise and get out of trouble to extend a play – you're now forcing the defense to have to defend all 11 players. And that wasn't necessarily the case with Justin Worley within this scheme. And a prime example of that is just every so often having the quarterback pull the ball off of the zone action, it it really creates a dilemma for the defense because if the quarterback can run the football, it does open things up a little bit. And sometimes with a young quarterback, you just go ahead and throw him in there and run the offense because he doesn't know what he doesn't know. And they know that he studies. They know that Josh Dobbs is very, very intelligent. Josh Dobbs is going to be a player, I think, in time that's going to be a very, very nice fit. And he learned some lessons last week, but he also did some very, very nice things. He had poise. He was composed. He was confident. He didn't allow negative things to linger with him. He was able to move on to the next play. And I, I think those are real signs of a guy that maybe has some intangibles that you got to have at the position. ESPN College Football Analyst Tom Luganbill, also the National Director of Recruiting, joining us here on the New Sentinel Sports page, Vince Ferrara, Evan Woodbury. Staying on the zone read, Tom, how much in college football do you think the, some of those zone reads are, dis, are predetermined calls where they're just playing out the, the, the read uh, fake? And then how much of those do you think are true reads of that end? 
Well, a lot of it depends on if they're leaving a player unblocked. You can actually tell very, very clearly if it's a designated call for the quarterback to keep the football, they're going to block everybody. If it's going to be a true read, whether it's at the tackle position on the inside or whether it's on the defensive end position, then you're going to see that because you're going to see an unblocked defender. And I think you bring up a really good point because the phrase zone read is thrown around so much, and I don't think people really truly understand exactly what it is. If there even is a read, they just understand the action in the backfield that they're seeing. But that action is exactly what it is. It's zone action. And until you see an unblocked defender that is able to be read, Essentially, it's just zone. There is no read. So there are designated calls for the quarterback to keep it. Uh, There are calls just for it to be a pure zone play, whether it's inside or out. And then, of course, with the unblocked defender, then you're going to have the run concept come into that. And and that's true across the board. But, uh, again, I like that you brought that point up because I think it's such a misconstrued phrase in term because the spread offense and what people term to be the zone read isn't necessarily a read, and oftentimes it's not a read. Tom, uh, just briefly on the SEC and the big picture, I, I've now put Missouri as my second-best team in the SEC. I've said they're going to win out and, and play Alabama in, the, in Atlanta, and I still feel like there are a lot of people that still don't believe in Missouri, and I, I almost say, like, what more can they do at this point to, uh, to show people that they're for real? Uh, I'm I'm a believer now. I don't know about you, but but what, what do you see as the the SEC in the big picture now with with a few weeks left in the year? Well, you know I've had Missouri twice, and and they are much better than people are giving them credit for. They're better on on defense. You know they're one of the few teams in this conference right now that you know has true edge pass rushers. You know Jadavion Clowney's one at South Carolina, but Missouri's got two or three, even four. So their depth along the defensive front is really really good. And then offensively, they have dynamic playmakers, and they've been very, very efficient at quarterback, even without James Franklin in the in the backfield. And I think they're either going to see him back this week versus Kentucky, or certainly thereafter, because they've got big games coming up against Ole Miss and Texas A&M. But I also believe that while Missouri is better than people have given them credit for, they're also, I think, a, a byproduct of what has become a very discombobulated SEC East, whether it's injuries or teams being down. You know, both Florida and Georgia are just a shell of what they were in the first couple of weeks of the season. And so I think you've had uh, some differences in, let's, let's just say, some of the premier teams not being as efficient, which has allowed for Missouri to take a step up, take, front of, take advantage of some opportunities, um, which good for them because they need that confidence. They need to prove their worth. And for their long-term standing in the conference, they need to have early success so that the perception of them is that they belong, not that they were just brought in for the market from an SEC footprint standpoint. Tom, in watching Film Room, Tennessee's defense has come up a number of times when you've been highlighting the efficiency and the work of, of a few offenses. And just curious, what are your thoughts on what Tennessee does from a scheme standpoint, defensively, in studying them on film? Because they have had more and more busts as the season has gone on. What, what's your thoughts on Tennessee, what they do defensively? Well, in the first part of your question, a lot of that doesn't really have to do with, uh, you know, Tennessee's defense. We might just be accentuating something we're seeing that we're focusing on with the other team's offense, and it might just happen to be the Tennessee's on defense. But I think John Jancic has really tried to keep things simplified. When you've got a true freshman in Cam Sutton on the corner, you've got some injuries, you're banged up a little bit at safety. I know last week, because they were concerned with some of the formational situations and the playmakers that that Missouri presented. They they didn't go strong in free safety and rotate coverage much. They basically just had a left safety and a right safety, and they left them where they were because they were just a little bit concerned about some matchup problems. Uh, this is a pretty good football team when it comes to linebacker play, uh, but it's not consistent. This is a defense that has a long way to go. They're not overly athletic or explosive or deep within their interior guys up front. So I think they're trying to do the best they can with the personnel that they inherited and not get too complicated to the point where they start doing too much and don't do any one thing well. The biggest thing for Tennessee is keeping the ball in front of them. If they can do that and they can tackle in the open field, 
then I think they've got an opportunity to, to, to be in good shape. Uh, but they cannot afford to give up big plays over the top. That's critical. What's Butch Jones like when you have those production meetings, getting ready for a game, when you're just in a conference room? Or do you hear the same things you hear in the public quotes, or is he different? What, what's that like? Very mild-mannered, very cautious with what he says, not to hide anything or to keep things close to the vest. In fact, I would say the exact opposite. He's very open and honest with his football team where they're at. But when I say Kosh, he's very thoughtful in giving his responses and wants to be very clear on, on his view of things. You know, I've developed a good relationship with him and his staff and some guys through some recruiting channels and, and then now having covered them on, on the gridiron. But it is very clear that they are going through a growth process of a culture change. And, you know, he's used the phrase, institutionalized and i don't know if you guys have heard that phrase from him before but what he re- what he's referencing there is this team has only known one thing they've known change they've known negativity they've known losses they haven't enjoyed bowls this is a team that is has been institutionalized to only see one side of things and so what he's trying to do is is create the environment in the path to show the other side. And it's not something you wave a magic wand at, but he's very clear, he's very concise, and he's laid down a blueprint, and they have the resources in place to accomplish that. That's the thing that's beautiful now. They've completely restructured their academic support services program. Uh, They're now off the APR list. The new facility is upon completion. All the things are in place for this thing to make a run. Tom, give us your thoughts on what are some of the key things to look for in this Auburn-Tennessee matchup on Saturday. Well, you know, if you go back to the South Carolina game, one of the things that played a really, really big role in that game was field position early for South Carolina on offense. They were so backed up, and the crowd really became a factor. And with an offense that you call at the line of scrimmage, which South Carolina did, they did not have adjustments, and they really struggled with crowd noise. Well, Auburn calls things at the line of scrimmage right now, too. And so I think it's going to be imperative for the crowd to get involved. And if Tennessee can pin Auburn back and force them to play out of a hole. Listen, all, Gus Malzahn's done a phenomenal job. And this is a team that is playing well. They're playing confident. They're not as talented as their record would indicate. And so they've made some right moves and some plays here and there. They've had some big wins and, and some wins on the road. But I think there's still a team that realizes that every time they take the field, they could be beat. And so I believe if you're Tennessee, you've got to look at them on tape and feel the exact same way. Uh, For me, uh, Auburn's banged up a little bit on defense, and they've had a lot of different faces in the secondary. So if there could be some one-on-one chances you know, with uh, Alton Howard, with uh, Marquez North, for Josh Dobbs to have an opportunity to get some big plays under his belt. I think that's the thing that needs to happen for this Tennessee offense, guys. They just need to have something good happen, whether it's a a five-yard out that turns into an 80-yard touchdown or a post route that's caught instead of dropped. And, you know, those sorts of things, once that happens, I think it could, you know, flip a switch for them, and then confidence plays a big role. That's what Auburn has coming into this game. They have confidence. They don't know they're not as good as, as, their, pro, as their record is, but they think they are, and that's a big, you know, component of the matchup. Last thing with you, Tom, I appreciate your time. Just uh, out of the three big matchups this this weekend, two tonight, one on Saturday, uh, just who do you like in those matchups going with the favorites? You know, I I like Oregon. In fact, I think the, this Oregon Stanford game uh, could get played out very similar to what we saw from Florida State Miami last week. I just I don't think this is the same Stanford team that has faced off against Oregon the last couple of years. I see Oregon running away with it. The one that intrigues me the most, without question, is the Baylor Oklahoma game because the next four weeks will define who Baylor really is or who they are not, and so they're going to be, I think, certainly threatened but I still like Baylor in the Oklahoma matchup at home because Baylor's been exceptional at home. And the thing that's so intriguing about LSU-Alabama, guys, is you become so accustomed and conditioned to seeing two physical teams in the trenches, teams that can run the football at will, and it's going to be a battle of attrition for four quarters. But guess what? This time around, it might be about the skilled position players on offense for both LSU and Alabama. 
So I think the defensive secondaries will have their hands full for both teams in that matchup in Tuscaloosa. Tom, talk about ESPN film room, air times, and then some other coverage you have going on, including your recruiting coverage. Yeah, you know, each and every week film room airs for us on Wednesday, and it will re-air on Saturdays before the slate of games on ESPNU. We've got Recruiting Nation airing tonight, every Thursday on ESPNU. And then, of course, on Mondays, we've got BCS Countdown and Grade 8 plays, college football daily each and every week on ESPNU, and the experts, of course, on Tuesday, which is a lot of fun. So it's a full week before we head out to the games. At Tom Luganbill on Twitter as well. Tom, you're the best. Really appreciate you. Have fun here in Knoxville. Take care. Thanks, man. Thanks. That is Tom Luganbill from ESPN joining us here on the New Sentinel Sports page.